Okay, good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Naveen Nimala. So as of now, I'm working at the Yashoda Hospitals as senior consultant at Hyrex City branch. So today we'll be going through the MRCM primary high yield topics, mostly relevant to anatomy and physiology because the webinar lasts approximately one, and one hour. So in that, to cover everything is almost impossible. So I'll try to go ahead and we'll be going fast. And if you have any questions, you can contact me later on that uh, Telegram ID I've given there. So you can find me on this Telegram channel. So if you have any questions related to MRTM related queries, you can ask me there. Otherwise, uh, we'll try, try to go fast because uh, the time is very limited. So let's start with, they will ask you, there, is, there has been some pituitary adenoma in somebody. Now the optic chasm is getting compressed. What kind of symptoms can the patient have? When the optic chasm compresses, so optic chasm is compressed, they will have bitemporal hemianopia. And where is this pituitary located? The pituitary is located in the cella tarsica and again in which bony part? So that's the sphenoid bone. So they can ask you the location or the bone name. If they tell you that someone comes to your ED with the feeling of slowing down, that means they are trying to tell you about Parkinsonism. So they might ask you what kind of area is responsible for this. That's the substantia nigra and uh, also called as nigrostriate area. And which kind of neurons are there in that area? That is dopaminergic neurons. They might give you a history of someone coming to the ED with stroke symptoms. If they say there has been lower limb weakness. So this is the homunculus. So motor and sensory, both of them have homunculus. So where each body part is represented, that's we call it as homunculus. So if ACA is involved, anterior cerebral artery, so this is the represented as red colored cerebral. So cerebral part is marketed as red. That's the ACA territory. So when this midline portion is affected, midline portion means here. So this is all midline portion. So that is affected means lower limb will be affected. So that's a hint that ACA is involved. If they tell you that there is face involvement or sensory area involvement, that means they're trying to tell you it's a MCA territory. This yellow zone is all MCA territory. If they tell you the person is not able to enjoy the things that he used to enjoy before, that means there is lack of emotions now. So emotions are dealt by the frontal lobe. So frontal lobe again is supplied by the ACA, anterior cerebral. So that way you can answer. Pharynx related, the gag reflex is mediated by both cranial nerves, cranial nerve nine and 10. How this works is the ovula is pulled towards, pulled upwards. So that's why when one side is weak, the uvula gets pulled to the opposite side. So uvula is going to deviate away from the weak side. Whereas in the tongue, it's the opposite. Tongue, when you ask them to put the tongue out, they are going to push it out. So you are pushing it outside. So if this side is weak, the tongue gets pushed to the weak side. So tongue goes towards the weak side, uvula goes towards the stronger side. And uh, vagus nerve, if there is any weakness, that means vagus nerve is compromised. So gag reflex, difficulty swallowing, when they say that, they are trying to tell you that glossopharyngeal is affected. And tongue lesions, so there are different kinds of tongue lesions. Anterior two-thirds is different from posterior one-third. So anterior two-thirds, you have two different nerve, uh, sensations. Taste sensation is carried out by facial nerve, that is cranial nerve seven via the carda tympani branch. Whereas the sensory, regular sensory, touch, pain, like that. So regular sensory is handled by the lingual nerve, which is again cranial nerve V3, means the trigeminal. V3 is mandibular branch. So the jaw jerk is mediated by the trigeminal nerve. Normally jaw jerk should be minimal or absent. If it's positive, it signifies something. So coming to the lymph drainage of the tongue. 
So lymph drainage from the anterior two thirds generally goes to the submental and submandibular glands and then goes to the deep cervical. Whereas posterior one third, it goes directly to the cervical. So one of the questions was there previously, the RCM has chosen the answer as cervical, but actually the tongue one anterior to third drains to the majority goes to the submandibular nodes. And when it comes to the posterior one third, both taste and sensory, both sensations are handled by the cranial nerve nine, that is glossopharyngeal. So coming to the ventricles of the brain, you have, First, you have the lateral ventricles, then they are connected to the third ventricle by the interventricular foramen of Monroe. Next, third ventricle will be connected to the fourth ventricle via the cerebral aqueduct. The last one is the fourth ventricle. So in the questions, they might say that there has been swelling of one of the ventricles, that's hydrocephalus. If they say only lateral ventricles are affected, that means this might be blocked, foramen of Monroe. If they say lateral ventricles and third, vent third ventricle, both of them are enlarged, that means there could be a blockage at cerebral aqueduct. So based on the question, you need to answer. So coming to the circle of villus. Circle of villus can have aneurysms and they can rupture. So when they rupture, that aneurysmal bleed will enter into which compartment? That is subarachnoid space. So symptoms, SAH symptoms. So sudden onset of severe headache, any flashing of lights, unable to tolerate the light. So all those symptoms could be there. The location of aneurysm, anterior communicating has the highest probability, about 30% of chances, and posterior communicating has 25% of chances. So majority go in the anterior communicating. If cranial nerve three is involved in a subarachnoid space scenario, that means, the lesion is located in the posterior communicating because cranial nerve 3 will exit closer to the posterior communicating artery. So whenever there is aneurysmal bleed that involves posterior communicating, cranial nerve 3 will be affected. So when oculomotor is having problems in subarachnoid hemorrhage, it points you towards the posterior communicating artery. Coming to visual fields. So visual field related questions do come in every time. So unless you understand the concept, it will be difficult. Just don't try to mug up the answers, understand the concept. You can divide the visual field, whatever you are seeing physically, that is called as visual field. So in the visual field, this side, one side, we call it as temporal zone and the middle part, we call it as nasal zone for each eye. So if I'm closing one eye, only one eye, I'm opening. So one side, lateral side, we call it as temporal. Medial side, we call it as nasal. So nasal is the medial side. This is the temporal side. That means we are looking at the visual field of left eye. So left eye visual field is like this. So retina is organized in crisscross fashion. Means whatever temporal will be arranged on the medial aspect whatever nasal will be represented on the lateral aspect of retina. Similarly, upper fibers go to the lower and upper visual fields go to the lower on retina and lower go to the upper. So this way, there is a crisscross arrangement of your visual field versus retina. And from retina, you have the fibers going to the visual cortex. So these medial two fibers will go to the opposite side of visual cortex means this is the left eye so left eye retina so in this medial two side medial side of fibers are going to the opposite side similarly from the right eye also we are getting fibers that are crossing over to the other side so this is the optic chiasm section whereas the lateral two they go to the same side this orange and yellow zones they represent to the same visual cortex Whereas this red and green, they cross over to the other side. So this is how the arrangement is made. Now let's look at the, now all these four fibers together, we call them as optic nerve. So all the fibers that represent these four quadrants of retina, we call it as optic nerve. And these we call it as optic tracts. So this is the overall arrangement of your visual field system. Now, 
if we see the same thing for two eyes. Now, this is the left eye, this is the right eye. Now, this is the visual fields. Let's look at what happens if there is a lesion. If there is a lesion at the optic nerve, so all of these retinal fibers will not be able to reach the brain. So all these dotted lines are representing the right retina, solid lines are representing the left retina. So all the right side, you're not able to see, the brain will not be able to see it. So all the visual fields of the right eye are gone. So this is the complete blindness will be seen in the right eye. What if there is optic chiasm lesion? So just like what we have seen, pituitary adenoma, optic chiasm is having an issue. So in that case, those crisscross to the other side are mostly affected, means the medial aspect of both eyes. So medial aspects of retina means what is the visual field that is affected? Lateral aspects of visual fields. So both eyes will have temporal field problems. So now the temporal both sides will be having problems. That's why we call it as bitemporal hemianopia. Hemi means half, anopia means loss of vision. So half loss of vision, so bitemporal. Both the temporal sides, we are not able to see. Next lesion, what if both the tracks are gone? So if the tracks are gone, as you can see, these solid lines are coming from the left retina and these dotted lines are coming from the lateral part of the same side retina. Now you will not be able to see the left half of the visual field means in the left eye it is temporal field in the right eye it is the nasal fields so here we cannot say by temporal because one side temporal is gone one side nasal is gone so we call this as homonymous hemianopia homonymous means in the both eyes we are having similar side defect so left side of field is deficient in both the eyes so this is homonymous hemianopia as the problem is on the right side and left half is gone, we can also call this as contralateral homonymous hemianopia. So similarly, we have this as Meyer's loop. When this Meyer's loop is gone, you will have a problem with one quadrant. So he, till this point, if both are gone, half vision will be gone. So after this point, if only radiations are affected, you will have quadrant issues. So now you have superior quadrant gone. So this is, we call it as homonymous because again, same side quadrants are gone. So we call this as superior quadrant tonopia, homonymous superior quadrant tonopia. Same, now homonymous quadrant tonopia inferior because of this loop, this radiation. So we call this, this purple one as lateral geniculate ganglion. So lateral geniculate body, so you have two kinds of geniculate. So medial and lateral. So medial M for M, you can say. So that is this nucleus in lateral L for L, means L for light. So you can say it takes care of vision. Whereas medial is M for M. So M for music, so it is for auditory. So medial geniculate nucleus is for auditory. Lateral geniculate nucleus is for vision. So this macula spading will be there because this macula is represented on both sides. So that's one of the explanations. If both tracks, both radiations are gone, even then the macula will be spared. This is about the visual fields. Now let's look at the cranial nerve palsies, especially related to the eye. So if cranial nerve three is gone, so there will be weakness of adduction and the eye will be outward and downward. So eye will be out and down. Whereas cranial nerve four, it causes diplopia that is force on downward gaze. They'll be having problem pulling the eyeball down. So when they won't tell you like directly, they're look, uh, looking downwards. Instead, they might say in the question, they're trying to get down the stairs or they're trying to read a newspaper, they're having a diplopia problem at that point. Otherwise, they don't have this issue. So that means they are trying to tell you cranial nerve four has problem. Cranial nerve six, 
this will have medial deviation of the eyeball. So there will be inability to abduct the affected eyeball. And ciliary muscle takes care of accommodation. Accommodation means, say you are look, watching a TV. Now you want to suddenly take a look at the phone. So TV is look at, located at a distance. So that's called far vision. Now you want to have a near vision. So in that case, your eyes should have accommodation to be able to see the near structures immediately clearly. So if that ciliary muscle is weak, you will have delay in getting those things clear or you will not be able to see properly. Now let's look at the light reflex. In light reflex, when you put a light into one of the eyes, the eye will try to constrict because there is too much of light rays coming in. So I will try to constrict. So how does that happen? It is via the light reflex. So whenever you put a light, that reaches the brain via the cranial nerve too, that is optic nerve. So optic nerve tells the brain that there is too much of light coming in. So to protect the eyes, now the brain will send impulses to both the eyes to constrict the pupil. So pupil reconstruction is handled by cranial nerve 3. So cranial nerve 2 tells the eyes about the light, 3 tells the eyes to constrict. So cranial nerve tells the brain about the light. Cranial nerve 3 tells the eyes to constrict. So now they can frame the question different ways. So they might say that, okay, now you have put a light in the eye. So we will label this as right eye. This is the left eye. So you have put light into the right eye. Left eye is constricting, but not the right. That means if even if one eye is constricting, that means you know that the brain is aware of the light. That means cranial nerve 2 is good on the right side. So it is not constricting means cranial nerve 3 is bad. Similarly, if they say you have put a light, pupil is constricting in the right eye, but the left is not constricting. Means left side cranial nerve 3 is having a problem. And another way is you have put a light. This is not constricting. And this is also not constricting. Both eyes are not constricting. Means cranial nerve 2 is not telling the brain about the light. So cranial nerve 2 is having a problem on the right side. So that way, multiple questions can be framed. So spinal pathways, you have both motor and sensory pathways. The motor pathways are represented in red, whereas the sensory ones are the blue ones, which go up to the brain and the motor ones come down from the brain to the rest of the body. So if you notice, the inner fibers represent the upper body, whereas the peripheral fibers represent the lower body. So if you notice, there is especially look at the descending trunks, the motor ones. It is the cervical ones that are in the medial side, then thoracic, then lumbar, and then sacral. So the significance of this is in whenever there is a problem in the middle of the spinal cord, the upper limbs will be affected more. That we call it as central cord syndrome. So how is the function of this? Spinothalamic fibers, they take care of the pain and temperature. Whereas the dorsal columns, they take care of the touch and proprioception. So spinothalamic for pain and temperature, dorsal columns for touch and proprioception. So if you notice, this is the dorsal column and the right one is the spinothalamic. So spinothalamic, as soon as they enter the spinal cord, they go to the other side. So spinothalamic go to the other side immediately. S per S. So they move to the other side on the same level. Whereas dorsal columns, D for D. So they jump to the other side at a different level. So they go up in the spinal cord in the same side and then they jump to the other side in the medulla. So D for D. So the significance of this is, say you have a problem. So now spinal cord has been damaged in this half, one side. So because of this, the tracks that represent the, so now the, there is a problem on the left side. So the tracks that represent the right side of the body, 
will not be able to reach the brain. So they will have a problem with pain and temperature on the opposite side. Whereas this one, so these tracks are going to supply to the same side of the body. So dorsal columns defects like touch and proprioception will be gone on the same side of the body. Whereas pain and temperature sensations are gone from the opposite side of the body. Coming to cord injuries, you have three different syndromes, central cord, anterior cord, and brown circuit syndrome. There is also something called as posterior cord syndrome also. So in central cord syndrome, as I told you, the question might say someone is having a neck injury and lost power, which is more in the upper limbs. So more power is lost in the upper limbs. So that's a hint towards central cord injury. There is loss of pain and temperature, but proprioception is preserved. So proprioception is handled by the dorsal columns. So dorsal columns are good, but the anterior part is affected. So that's the anterior cord syndrome. So instead of asking which syndrome, they can ask you which artery. So anterior spinal artery takes care of the supply in this region. So similarly in brown circuit, as we have discussed in the previous slide, the pain and temperature will be gone on the opposite side of the body. Whereas the touch and proprioception will be gone on the same side of the body. Cavernous sinus related, there are multiple nerves, cranial nerves that are going through it, but most of them are located peripherally. Only the abducens nerve that is located in the, within the sinus. So most commonly affected cranial nerve is the curvature sin cavernous sinus thrombosis is the cranial nerve 6. That gets affected first. Rest will be affected after some time. So if they say that there has been nasal infection and now cavernous sinus has been thrombosed. So which sinus could have been affected? So especially the sphenoid sinus, if you can notice, that is located right adjacent to it. Whenever there is sphenoid sinus infection, that can spread easily. Also, the vein that can spread the infections from the face to the cavernous sinus. So it, you can have either inferior ophthalmic or the facial. So all of them are in touch with the cavernous sinus. So they can actually go and infect the cavernous sinus. That way, there is contamination. So lumbar puncture, the site can be either L3, L4 or L4, L5. So if both are given, choose L3, L4. Similar to the uh, and one more question related to lumbar puncture is sometimes they will ask you there is a pop sound the final pop felt before we enter the CSF that means the final one they are asking about the the final resistance you face is the dura matter so if they say the final one you can answer dura matter otherwise every time you go through a ligament that's one of the resistance points. If they say immediately before they enter into the CF space, that's the dura matter. Facial nerve related issues. Facial nerve has either upper motor kind or lower motor kind of weakness. So the face is supplied by the facial nerve like this. So this is the supply to the forehead and the other uh, side of the face. But the forehead part receives supply from both sides. So right side supplies the left side of forehead and left side supplies the right side forehead also. So whenever there is a upper motor neural lesion or central lesion, so yellow zones will not work. So yellow is gone. But this side forehead is receiving blue pathways also. Blue fibers are also coming. So the frowning will be preserved in upper motor lesion. Whereas in lower motor, all the fibers are cut. So the opposite fibers that are coming to supply are also cut. So you will have problem with proning. Proning will be lost in lower motor neural lesion. So facial nerve has multiple branches in the face. Once it comes out and it starts to branch in the parotid. So remember facial nerve is going through the parotid, but it will not supply the parotid gland. So, but whenever there is a parotid gland issues like parotitis, 
facial nerve branches can be affected. So they might say someone has parotitis. Now they're having a problem closing the eyes fully. That means orbicularis oculi muscle is impacted. But the frowning is not impacted, which is done by frontalis. So which branch could be damaged? So there are multiple branches here. One is temporal, zygomatic, buccal, mandibular, and cervical. So these are the five branches from the facial. So if this orbicularis oculi is good and frontalis is Sorry, orbicularis oculi is bad, but frontalis is good means temporal is not affected. So the answer will be zygomatic. Similarly, vice versa. So if they say that frontalis is affected, frowning is affected, but they're able to close the eyes properly. That means zygomatic is good, temporalis is gone. So then whenever there is parotid injury, they can have one of the branches of this facial nerve affected and also you can have this artery affected. So you will have facial nerve and maxillary artery both go through nearby. So maxillary artery can also be affected. So if they say they're unable to purse the lips, that means they're trying to tell you about the orbicularis oris muscle. So which is supplied by the buccal branch. So that's having a problem. So there is a blood fracture because of someone has been punched in the face or on the eyeball, which sinus is damaged. So this is the maxillary sinus that is damaged. So now sometimes this inferior rectus can get entrapped in the fracture. So that inferior rectus will not allow this eyeball to go up. So whenever there is a upward gaze tried by the victim, they will not be able to move the eyeball up. So they will have diplopia on upward gaze because inferior rectus is impinged. They'll say someone had a stuck ear, uh, some earring that is stuck. So you want to remove it. What kind of nerve block will you apply? So generally, ear, ear rings are applied on the lobule area. So lobule area is green detrital, which is supplied by great auricular nerve. So you need to block the great auricular nerve. Whereas if they say the tragus part and all, auricular temporal nerve will be applicable. So this is how you have the trigeminal, which is split up into ophthalmic, mandibular, and sorry, maxillary and mandibular. Ophthalmic is the orange zone. Yellow is the maxillary. This grayish zone is the mandibular. So auricular temporal nerve is coming out of the mandibular division. So if they say upper teeth sensation is gone, that means they are trying to tell you that it's the mandibular division that is having problem. And if they say tip of the nose, Tip of nose is red in color. So that is supplied by the ophthalmic division. Scrotum related, if they say cremasteric reflex is lost, what could be the cause? So in this, the green zone is the problematic one. So green zone is the B, that is ilioinguinal nerve. So because of either torsion, or uh, due to some other causes, if they say cremasteric reflex is lost, most likely they are interested in knowing the nerve that is ilioinguinal nerve. So esophagus has three constrictions. So when they say that they are swallowing, if they have swallowed the foreign body, now it's stuck at the level of T4, T5. What could be the reason? So the three constrictions are at the esophageal pharyngeal junction and where the aorta crosses the esophagus and where the esophagus enters into the stomach, into the st uh, abdomen through the diaphragm. So these are the three levels of constrictions. If they say someone is having hoarseness in the voice, that means there could be a problem with recurrent laryngeal nerve. So if you notice the recurrent laryngeal nerve takes a long route. So hoarseness of voice, recurrent laryngeal nerve, if they say there is a 
soft voice. They are not saying hoarseness. The voice is low pitched and soft. That means the problem is in the superior laryngeal nerve. So hoarseness, recurrent laryngeal nerve, softness, superior laryngeal nerve. Coronary innervation, sorry, blood supply. So you need to know which part is supplied by which artery. So sometimes they will ask you SA node, AV node. So that is right coronary. And uh, sometimes they will ask you posterior wall. So posterior wall, again, you have to say that it's the right coronary, posterior part of IVS. And even the left coronary is going to supply the LA and LV. So LAD is mostly taking care of the anterior aspect of interventricular septum. So that way you need to know the artery and region that is supplied by it. So the pericardium gets its innervation via the phrenic nerve. So whenever there is pericardial irritation, they will have pain sensation that is carried by the phrenic nerve. When you're trying to do a pericardiosynthesis because of either tamponade or pericardial effusion, in that case, the needle, if you advance it too much, that can go and pierce the right ventricular valve. So right ventricular valve. So the damage can occur to the right ventricle. Sensations. So if they say that there has been numbness around the rectum, so that is the S5 they are trying to tell you. If they say that there is supraclavicular fossa involvement, so they are trying to tell you about the C3. First web space that is supplied by the deep peroneal. So sub first web space by deep peroneal. So L4, L5 will be applicable for that. Nipple T4, Z5 is T6 and umbilicus T10. One of the dermatomes is guaranteed to be in the exam. So make sure you remember these important dermatomes. So most likely location of the ectopic. Most of the times it's the ampulla. So ampulla has about 70% of chances. And when there is a rupture and bleed starts, which could be the source of bleed. So it can be internal iliac, which takes care of most of the uterus or the ovarian artery. So one of these two arteries are probable causes of bleeding. Coming to colon. So ascending colon, in fact, is there on investigation, which artery could be blocked. So the artery that supplies the ascending colon is right colic artery. This is number four. So that's the right colic. If they give you right colic, you can choose it. If they don't give right colic, right colic is a branch of superior mesentery. So this main artery is the superior mesentery. So both of them can be given as answers. So if they give both right colic and superior mesentery, remember you have to choose the most specific answer. That's why this exam is called as single best answer. So when you have two probable answers, which is the best should be selected. So both can be correct. So SMS applies which part and IMS applies which part. So superior mesentery supplies the mid gut portion of the entire gut. So small intestine and ascending to two thirds of the transverse. Rest of the part after this will be supplied by inferior mesentery, which is the hand gut portion. So embryologically, how it develops is going to decide from where it is going to receive the blood supply. So pain referral is based on the embryological origin again. So any foregut pain will be referred to the epigastric region. Midgut pain will be referred to the umbilicus. So as I told you, this is all midgut. So whenever there is um, appendix related pain, initially the appendix related pain also starts in the umbilical region. So once the inflammation is too much and visceral peritoneum is affected, then only it gets localized to the McBurney's point. Otherwise, it starts in the umbilical region. So the hand gut, it goes to the pubic region. So hand gut related pain will go to the pubic region. So muzzle testing. So the lift off test is done for evaluating the suprascap, sorry, subscapularis muzzle. Similarly, the horn blow test is done for teres minor 
and instead of t risk minor they can ask you which nerve is impacted now so the axillary nerve supplies the t risk minor minor muscle so both can be asked if there is winging of scapula this is one of the favorite questions for the examiners so winging of scapula does appear a lot so serratus anterior is the muscle that is weak and that can be due to now that is problematic that is long thoracic nerve so serratus anterior muscle or long thoracic nerve either can be passed when they say weight lifting that led to weakness so the muscle involved is in weight lifting is mostly latissimus dorsi so it depends on the question scenario so when you are doing thoracotomy which muscle is damaged so this is the posterior view we are seeing so when you go in a posterior lateral fashion obviously you'll have to cut the latissimus dorsi if you are coming from the anterior side serratus anterior will be cut so posterior lateral latissimus dorsi anterior lateral it is the serratus anterior and instead of that they might ask you like someone has been stabbed at mid axillary line at the fifth intercostal space which muscle is damaged so again that answer is serratus anterior and also during thoracotomy the structure that can be damaged is internal mammary artery or some of the subcostal arteries veins nerves all of them can be damaged so diaphragmatic openings again one of the favorite topics for the examiners so they will ask you the levels so t8 t10 t12 thoracic vertebral levels so t8 this is where the inferior vena cava right phrenic branches go so this is the vena cava opening t10 is the esophagus and vagal trunks t12 the aorta as i goes and hemi as i goes so this diaphragm is supplied by the phrenic nerve sometimes they will tell you half of the phrenic diaphragm uh, sorry half of the diaphragm is flattened that means there is a paralysis of that side phrenic nerve coming to hernias so this is the inguinal canal so if there is a this we call it as the di uh, direct inguinal hernia will be going through this whereas indirect will go through this and then that it traverses the inguinal canal and then emerges outside so direct one emerges medial to the inferior epigastric vessels so these are the inferior epigastric vessels so this view is from the posterior side so this is the pubic symphysis and this is the lateral side so we are looking at the abdominal wall from the posterior side that's why the innermost layer we can see is the transversalis fascia so instead of them saying this what is the weakness in this direct inguinal hernia so that's the transversalis fascia if this fascia is weak you can have a hernia so spigillian hernia or direct inguinal hernia in both of them the weakness is in the transversalis fascia and direct hernia emerges medial to the epigastric vessels that is inferior epigastric vessels so these inferior epigastric vessels will run in the rectus sheath so rectus sheath hematoma if it's there it can actually compress on these vessels so rectus sheath hematoma can compress on the inferior epigastric vessels so these organs all abdominal organs are retroperitoneal or peritoneal so retroperitoneal depending on how they reach there some of them are manufactured there itself means they were made in the retroperitoneal space and they stayed in the retroperitoneum they, that we call it as primarily retroperitoneal but if they have developed elsewhere in the peritoneum now by the time the development is complete if they happen to reach the retroperitoneal space from peritoneal space we call them as secondarily retroperitoneal so you have urinary related adrenal glands kidneys ureters circulatory aorta inferior vena cava digestive esophagus rectum and these parts are all retroperitoneal they develop there and stay there whereas secondary retroperitoneal the head neck and body of the pancreas 
but not the tail. Duodenum, except for the proximal first segment, is retroperitoneal. Ascending and descending portions of the colon are retroperitoneal. When they say that there is E fast positive, that means they are asking about which peritoneal structure is damaged. So you have to rule out these structures. These structures are all retroperitoneal. So any damage to these structures will not lead to peritoneal fluid collection. So when there is E fast positive, the first collection will be seen in the right hepatorenal space. So the lung, mid-lobe auscultation point and also the horizontal fissure location is sometimes asked. So that is at the fourth intercostal space on the right side. So number four is the intercostal space number. So fourth intercostal space on the right side should be the answer. Coming to dermatomes again, the ring finger that is C6 and sometimes they will ask you the nerve root that is C6. Sorry, ring finger is C8, thumb is C6. And if they say that finger abduction is lost, which nerve root is affected? So abduction is handled by pad dab. So pad dab, they're supplied by the ulnar nerve. So ulnar nerve has a nerve root of C8, T1. If they ask you the nerve root, you can say C8, T1. If they ask you where is the vertebral damage, that is at the C7, T1, because C8 is... Uh, C8 T1 is the nerve root, C7 and T1 is the vertebral level because we don't have the C8 vertebra. So C7 T1 is, should be the answer if they ask vertebra. So coming to metacarpal fractures, so base of little finger metacarpal is displaced after a fracture. So which muscle is most likely to be responsible for this displacement? So if you know what is attaching there, you'll be able to answer this. So that is the extensor carpi ulnaris. So that is attaching at the base of the fifth metacarpal. So now similarly, if they ask about second metacarpal base, that is the extensor carpi radialis longus. And third, extensor carpi radialis brevis. So two and three, it is by extensor carpi radialis. One is longus for sec third, second one. The th for the third one, it is the brevis. Now, four of muscles, they originate from two epicondyles, medial and lateral. So, lateral epicondyle of the humerus is going to give rise to wrist extensors, whereas medial epicondyle gives wrist flexors. Now, if there is a problem at the lateral epicondyle, that is giving rise to pain, pain, we call that as tennis elbow. Similarly, for the medial epicondyle, we call it as golfer's elbow. And all the muscles of posterior forearm compartment, they are supplied by radial nerve. Whereas the anterior compartment, those wrist flexors are supplied by ulnar and median nerve. So paper grip test, also called as prominent sign, indicates weak adductor pollicis, which is going to signify ulnar nerve damage. So if someone is unable to make a fist, that means there could be a problem with flexion of fingers. So especially if there is median nerve damage at the elbow, the hand will be held in hand of benediction pose because there is a problem with the flexion. So now if the damage is at the wrist, there will be same position, but forearm will be affected. So that's how it is. So median now is going to take care of the contraction of the reflection of these two fingers. So ulnar is able to function with the medial two fingers, but index and middle finger, they are handled by the median now. So this is lost. So they cannot flex these two. So in ulnar nerve injury, there will be claw hand. Radial nerve injury will lead to extensor muscles weakness, wrist extension will be gone. So there will be wrist drop. So impingement syndrome at the shoulder level, that can be due to thickening of coracoacromial ligament. When that happens, there is a compromise, that is compression on the ligam, uh, tendon that is of supraspinatus muscle. 
So supraspinatus muscle tendon is compressed and that leads to pain whenever they are trying to abduct. And this acromioclavicular joint stability is dependent on which ligament? So the majority of the stability depends on coracoclavicular ligament. So coracoid process to the clavicle. So, so the shoulder abduction is handled by multiple muscles. So the initiation is handled by the supraspinatus. So the first 15 degrees of abduction is handled by the supraspinatus. Now 15 to 90 degrees, it is handled by the deltoid. And above that, it is mostly by the rotation of scapula by trapezius. And stabilization is done by serratus anterior and trapezius. So if they say that they are not able to take the hand above the head, that means they are trying to tell you beyond 90 degrees, the extension is not occurring, abduction is not occurring. So there is a problem with trapezius. So trapezius is supplied by accessory nerve. So they can ask you like that. Or they might say there is a problem in initiation of abduction. So initiation is handled by supraspinatus. So th there is a problem with supraspinatus. Similarly, if they say that there is a problem with deltoid. So 15 to 90 degrees is gone. Instead of saying deltoid, they might ask which nerve is having an issue. So deltoid is supplied by axillary nerve, C5, C6 nerve root. And similarly, if they say there is shoulder abduction problem and elbow flexion problem. So both are supplied by C5, C6. So deltoid axillary is C5, C6 and biceps musculoskeletal, musculocutaneous branch is also by C5, C6. So both of them are having the same nerve root. If they say that there has been arm fracture, upper arm, now humerus fracture, there is a spiral groove behind the humerus. So in that spiral groove, you have radial nerve and profunda vessels, both are located. Sometimes they will tell you there is a radial nerve problem, radial nerve has been damaged, which other structure can be damaged. So radial nerve is known to everyone almost. So they will try to test you what is the other structure that can be damaged. So profunda vessels are also going in the same space. Coming to the pelvic region, they might ask you the safe region to give a deep IM injection. So that is outer upper quadrant, that is superlateral quadrant. If there is a pain on adduction, but not on flexion. So that means they are only interested in knowing the adductors, not related to flexion of the hip joint. So in that case, you can choose grassless, which is on the adductor compartment. If they say there has been an injury that led to snapping sensation and there is avulsion fracture found on the anterior superior iliac spine, they are trying to tell you about the sartorius. So it's the sartorius that is having an issue. If they say that there has been an avulsion of anterior inferior iliac spine, there the rectus femoris is going to be attached. So to check the weakness of abductors of the hip, you can do a test that is Trendelenburg sign. So you have to ask them to stay or stand on both legs and then ask them to elevate one leg. So fold one leg. So if it tilts on to that side, that means the abductors on the standing leg are weak. So which are supplied by the superior gluteal nerve. So gluteus medius and minimus, these are the main abductors which are weak. And instead of asking the muscles, they might ask you the nerve that is superior gluteal nerve. So the sciatic nerve, it supplies the hip posterior aspect. So all the posterior muscles in the hip and in the leg, sole, everything posterior side is handled by the sciatic nerve because sciatic nerve is going to split into posterior tibial, sorry, tibial and common peroneal nerves. So hip extensors and knee flexors, all of them are supplied by the sciatic nerve. So knee extensors are on the anterior aspect of thigh. So they will be supplied by the femoral nerve. So the sciatic nerve divides into tibial and common peroneal nerves. 
and common peritoneal nerve will again divide into superficial and deep branches. So the superficial branch takes care of the lateral compartment. Lateral compartment means aversion of foot is handled by the superficial peritoneal nerve. Whereas the deep peritoneal handles the anterior compartment. Anterior compartment is going to handle the foot elevation. So dorsiflexion of foot is handled by the deep peritoneal. So when they say there is foot drop, that means they are trying to tell you deep peritoneal is affected. So deep peritoneal, one more hint is it supplies the first web space area. So between the great toe and second toe, the space is cutaneous supply is by deep peritoneal. When they say first web space is affected, they are trying to tell you about the deep peritoneal. So coming to femoral triangle. So they will ask you the border sometimes. So this is the triangle. In this, the order of contents is also important. So you can remember it as navel, N-A-V-E-L. So that is now on the lateral side, vein in the middle, sorry, artery in the middle, then the vein and lymphatics. So now artery, vein, N-A-V, that is the order of contents. Similarly, lateral border is, if you can notice, the sartorius muscle has been cut here. So the sartorius muscle makes up the lateral border of femoral triangle. So femoral hernia is going to compress on which structure? So you, as you know, the contents are now artery vein. Those are the important ones. So of these, the lowest pressure will be able to be handled by the veins. So even if there is a sim, uh, low pressure that is com compressing, the vein will be compressed first. So the first thing that gets compressed is the femoral vein. So this is the popliteal fossa. This is the lateral side. How can we say? The sciatic is dividing into posterior tibial nerve and common peroneal. Common peroneal goes towards the fibula. So this is the lateral side. This is the medial side. So coming to the boundaries, supramedial. This side, you have the semitendinous, semimembranous, gracilis on the supramedial. And lateral side, you have the biceps femoris. And inferior side, you have the gastronomous muscle. The floor is made of the joint capsule, distal femur, proximal tibia, popliteus muscle. And this is all covered by popliteal fascia. So even here, you need to know the order. Artery, vein, nerve. Artery on the medial side, vein in the middle, nerve on the lateral aspect. So this is terrible triad. also called as unhappy triad. So especially when there is sports activity going on, that can lead to this. So when there is an impact on the lateral aspect, so when someone is kicked on the lateral aspect of the knee, so the force will be on the lateral aspect. So that causes this movement. So now this medial part, medial collateral ligament is damaged. So this medial collateral ligament is attached to the meniscus, medial meniscus, and this meniscus is attached to the anterior cruciate ligament. That way, three of these things will be damaged. That's why it's called as a triad, that is terrible triad. So medial collateral ligament, medial meniscus, and anterior cruciate ligament all are connected with each other. So they are damaged together. Let's look at some physiology. So this is a Starling's law. So this is the normal operating point X. When you do an exercise, so the peripheral resistance will decrease and the contractility increases. So the blood volume, if you increase the blood volume, you will get the same result. And if there is positive inotropy, again, the same result. So the curve will move up with positive inotropy. So they might say you have started an inotrope to increase the blood pressure, how does it move the curve? So with that, it is going to move it upwards. When there is a heart failure, it is going to come down. So in heart failure, it will come down. With inotropy, it is going to go up. So resistance related question keeps coming up. That is flow versus radius of the blood vessel. 
So if you double the radius, what happens? The flow is going to change by radius to the power of four. So you made it twice. So two into two into two into two, that is 16 times. So if you increase the radius, flow increases by resistance decreases by 16 times. If you decrease the radius, resistance increases by 16 times. Cell organal functions. There are multiple cell organelles in the body. So lysosomes, they digest and recycle. So there is acid hydrolysis vehicle, vesicles. So their optimum pH is 5. That means during normal physiology, they won't be active. So rough endoplasmic reticulum and Golgi operators, they are concerned with the trimming, glycosylation and tagging. That means post-translational processing of the proteins. Whereas the Golgi is going to deliver proteins to the destination. Smooth endoplasmic reticulum is concerned with calcium storage and lipid production. Mitochondria, energy, calcium balance and signaling and heat production. So mitochondrial has been asked be before. So in Alzheimer's, the bad proteins are normally should be tagged and destroyed. So that doesn't happen. So bad proteins all accumulate in the Alzheimer's. So there are three kinds of white cells, granulocytes, lymphocytes, and monocytes. In granulocytes, again, you have three types, neutrophils, which reach the infection site within minutes. So this is again repeatedly asked. So which kind of cell reaches this site immediately after an infection. So phagocytosis, this is how they function. They phagocyte as the bacteria. Eosinophils, mostly concerned with allergies and large parasites. Basophils, they release the histamine and heparin, similar to the tissue mass cells. The other two kinds of cells, lymphocytes and monocytes. Lymphocytes are predominant in infectious mononucleosis. This was asked before. And monocytes, these are also phagocytes they become macrophages later on. In wound healing, as I told you, predominant cell in early infection, again, the early infection, you have first coagulation starts, then you have this green zone coming in. So neutrophils are going to come in first. Or they might say, instead of saying early in the inflammation, they might say after hemostasis. So hemostasis phase is this. So once hemostasis has completed, so neutrophils are coming in. So in infectious mononucleosis, as I told you, that's the lymphocytes. So coming to coagulation, so which factor could be deficient if there is a prolongation of PT? So PT is concerned with external. So you have extrinsic pathway and intrinsic pathway. PT is concerned with extrinsic. So this is the pathway. And where is APTT? So as the name is longer, you have longer pathway. So 8, 9, 11, 12 factors are concerned with the APTT. But with PT, only factor 7 is concerned. But after factor 10, this is the common pathway. So this is extrinsic pathway. This is intrinsic pathway. This is common pathway. So both can be Deficiency of anything can lead to common pathway involvement. So if they say there has been someone with a hemophilia, known hemophilia patient now has bleeding, which replacement should be done? So that is hemophilia A, means factor 8. So there are two kinds of hemophilias, 8 and 9 deficiencies. Hemophilia A for 8, B for 9. So the more prevalent one is hemophilia A. So we take factor eight replacement as answer. In case of one will bend factor deficiency, addition of platelets is deficient. In CKD patients, the erythropoietin production will be less. So they are prone for anemias. So that's the reason these patients keep receiving erythropoietin replacements in CKD sessions. So the cell, the body has mainly two compartments, intracellular and extracellular. In that intracellular compartment is more. So almost two thirds of the space is intracellular. Extracellular is one third. In the extracellular, there are two compartments. Interstitial fluid is two third, plasma is one third. So in the case, fetal edema burns the edema, where is the fluid 
leaking into. So in that case, the answer will be interstitial fluid. So the normal blood volume in adults is about 5 liters. Hematocrit in males is 0 0.41 per, 4 to 0.52. When you give IV fluid, that is hypotonic, that is going to cause swelling of cells. So edema of cells will be there. If you give hypertonic, the cell will start to shrink and this is useful in case of cerebral edema. So in that case, to reduce the cerebral edema, we give hypertonic fluids. So in case of optic neuritis, the conduction will be slowed down because there is damage to the myelin sheath. So nodes of Ranvier, they don't have myelin. So myelinated fibers have almost 50 times faster conduction. Whereas the thin unmyelinated fibers are the slowest ones. Again, in multiple sclerosis, there is a damage to the myelin sheet. So again, Hello, Dr. Amin sir. Hello. Namin sir. Hello. Due to some network issues, doctor will be connecting in two minutes. What do you guys have with the internet? Okay, Pavan, audible? Yes, sir. Okay. Screen is shared, right? Yes, sir. It's, it's been shared. Okay, we will continue. Uh, so the glucose moves via the facilitated transfusion, uh, facilitated transport, so which is established by the sodium active pump. 
So sodium active pump, how does it move the ions? Three sodiums go out, one potassium comes in. So, sorry, two potassiums come in. This is wrong. So this is two potassiums. So the gas dissolvability is going to depend on the Henry's law. So the autonomic related, you have bronchoconstriction is done by the parasympathetic nervous system. So which is going to release acetylcholine. So parasympathetic uses acetylcholine for both pre and post ganglionic transmission. Whereas for sympathetic pre ganglionic, it is the acetylcholine post ganglionic norepinephrine. Pavan, is there an issue? The people are raising hands. Sir, there is a network issue from your side, sir. Your video is being pausing. Okay. Just a second. I'll turn off my speaker video. Okay, is the screen okay now? Okay, uh, let's go ahead. So, static is the preganglionics is by acetylcholine, but postganglionics is by norepinephrine. So, the only exception is where even the sympathetic postganglionics use acetylcholine is sweat glands. Sometimes they will ask you neuromuscular junction, postganglionic receptor. You, what kind of sodium channels do you have? That is the ligand gated sodium channels. So myocyte versus SA node. In myocyte, the rest, resting membrane potential is minus 90 millivolts, which is low compared to the minus 60 millivolts in SA node. So the threshold is about minus 65 millivolts in myocyte, minus 40 in SA node. So the depolarization is going to occur by sodium channels, voltage gated fast sodium channels in myocytes. Whereas in case of uh, SA node, it's the calcium. So in SA node, it's the calcium for depolarization. In muscles, it's the sodium for the depolarization. Depolarization is same in both, loss of potassium. So coming to blood vessels, Systemic vascular resistance is mostly because of arterioles. Whenever you lose blood or there is postural hypotension, you tend to have baroreceptor reflex. So that is activated and ADH is released to conserve water from the kidneys. Once you give blood or fluid, so this ADH FX will start to wean off and total peripheral resistance starts to decrease. So TPR is first increased to raise the blood pressure. Once the fluid is replaced, this will come down. So nitrous oxide is a vasodilator. And whenever there is pulmonary embolism, you will have right ventricular or right load, uh, atrial preload increasing, sorry, after load increasing. Whereas the left atrium receive less blood. So left atrial preload decreases. So this is the hemoglobin curve. So to remember this, you have, uh, I have one thing to say that is exercise is the right thing to do. So when you do exercise, your body temperature increases. See what body increases. So as acid content will be high, so H plus will be high, two three dPG will be high in the blood. So whenever these things increase, there is right word shift. 
whenever the decrease, there is leftward shift of the green. So, feed hemoglobin is 2R, 2R instead of the in adult hemoglobin. So, carboxyhemoglobin will cause leftward shift. So, the shift will be towards the left in carboxyhemoglobin. to the map diastolic pressure plus one third of pulse pressure two into diastolic plus systolic by three so you have to know both the answers sometimes both can be asked so final output you calculate by heart rate into stroke volume so in athletes that goes down so to match cardiac output stroke volume should increase so in an athlete the stroke volume is higher than an athlete Cerebral pressure you calculate by the Sorry, it's lost again. Dr. Amin, sir. Yeah. Sir, your PPT is not being shown, sir. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Screen visible now? Yes, sir. Okay, sorry about that. So, coming to cerebral perfusion pressure. So, we calculate by doing MAP minus intracranial pressure. So, coming to heart rate, depending on the heart rate, you'll be able to figure out which is the pacemaker in the body. So, when they say there has been a heart block, now the heart rate is about 40 to 60. So, they say 50. That means it's the AV node. If they say the heart rate is currently 35, that means it's below the AV node. So SA node should be normally operational. So that is 60 to 100. So whichever has the highest rate will take control of the heart rate. So coming to receptors, the alpha one is at the smooth muscle for smooth muscle contraction. For example, vessels will be constricted. Alpha two they are inhibitory on the nerve terminals for feedback inhibition. Beta 1 is for inotropy or chronotropy at the heart. So you need to know what generates the heart rate. Uh, sorry, heart sounds. S1 is due to closure of mitral or tricuspid valve. S2 is for because of closure of aortic or pulmonary valve. S3, when the blood comes and hits the ventricular valve, you can get that. S4, 
when the ventricle is almost filled, when the atrium is trying to contract and push more blood into it, you might get an S4. It is because of atrial systole. So S2 is sometimes split. So normal flow of uh, events is aortic closes first, then the pulmonary. So A2, P2 is the sequence. Sometimes if there is aortic stenosis. So the aortic valve takes longer to close because the ejection from the left ventricle will take time. So this will get reversed, P2 to A2. Similarly, stroke volume will reduce and S2 will have reversal of split. So auscultation points, the locations and the auscultation points should be known to you. So this is where they are located. So the valve location is different from auscultation point location. So valve location is different. Auscultation point is where you have the blood flow direction. So for example, this green one, take this one. So that is the mitral valve. So this is located behind the left half of sternum opposite fourth intercostal, first co fourth coastal cartilage. But the blood will flow from left atrium to the left ventricle in this direction. So the blood flow direction is this. So we auscultated the apex beat. So that's the reason auscultation points are different. So every week we do conduct these webinars relevant to all the emergency medicine related topics. You can get notified about these webinars by subscription to this channel in telegram.me slash medmeet, med underscore meet. So diselectrolytemia. In hypokalemia, you will have prolonged PR and U waves. In hyperkalemia, Widen QRS, also sine wave pattern is the pre-arrest rhythm. Highest bicarb is there in the Hartman solution in IV fluids. Whenever there is hypocalcemia, there is prolongation of QTC and there is tetany, that is hypocalcemic tetany. Because whenever there is hypocalcemia, the sodium channel starts to open spontaneously. So pancreas, you have exocrine function. Lipase takes care of fats. When this is deficient, the fats will end up in the stools and stools will start to float in the toilet bowl. Trypsin handles the proteins. Alpha secretes glucagon. Beta cells secrete the insulin. Epsilon secretes the ghrelin for hunger control. So one of these will be tested definitely. In diabetes mellitus, type 1 is lack of insulin. Type 2 is resistance to the available insulin. In DKA, once you start with insulin treatment, the potassium starts to decrease. So you need to replace it. So the major ketone in human body is beta hydroxybutyrate that we try to detect to diagnose DKA. If the patient is hypoglycemic, if they are conscious, you can try glucose gel or some carbohydrate meal or you can give glucagon IM. So if they're unconscious, you can give 20% glucose 100 ml or even glucagon can be given. But if they tell you that someone is chronically hypoglycemic or malnourished, in them the glycogen stores may not be there, so glucagon will not be able to help. So portal hypertension and can cause ascites, also hypoalbuminemia. If hypoalbuminemia is, can, is causing ascites, give replacement. If there is resection of terminal ileum, that can cause the deficiency of both vitamin D or B12. So because ileum is going to take care of B12 and D absorption. So the duodenum, mostly calcium and iron, also vitamin A, D, E, K. So water is mainly handled by colon. So what happens in large intestine is reabsorption of water. Intrinsic factor is secreted by the stomach cells. So this is where it comes from. Parietal cells secrete both acid and intrinsic factor for B12 absorption. Cheap cells secrete pepsinogen. Parietal cells secrete H+, and they have hydrogen pump. So proton, proton pump. So proton pump inhibitor is going to bind to parietal cell. Or instead of saying parietal cell, they might say 
proton pump. So peptic ulcers increase when there, were, there is increased high gastrin. Prostaglandins are uh, protective. They increase the mucin uh, alkaline content. Mucin rich, uh, sorry, alkaline mucus will be more when there is increased prostaglandin. That is a protective mechanism. So cholecystokinin is secreted by the duodenum. So it increases pile release. When they say there is pain after a fatty meal, that means there is gallstones. The liver detox enzymes are secreted by the ribosomes. If someone is on steroids for a long time, there will be cortisol suppression. So that uh, entire uh, axis is suppressed and cortisol levels will be low. If you suddenly stop steroids, they will have deficiency. If they say there is head injury and polydipsia and polyuria, that means there is ADH that is problematic. We call that as central DI, central diabetes insipidus. If the lithium toxicity is leading to polydipsia and polyuria, we call it as nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. Anti-repetitory secrets, growth hormone, FSH, LH, prolactin, and TSH. Post-repetitory handles, vasopressin, and ADH. So especially when they say there is small cell lung cancer, it's a focus for ADH secretion. So SADH is possible in them. So they keep losing water. So low plasma osculatory will be there and sodium hyponatremia will be there because of dilution. So endocrine disorders, PTH and ADH, both act on the collecting the tubule or distal convoluted tubule. If DCT is there in the options, choose that. Otherwise, collecting tubule can be choose, chosen. So calcium should be adjusted for albumin. So whenever you measure serum calcium, you have to adjust it for albumin, corrected calcium. So if you have high calcium and high PTH and phosphate is less, that means it's because of PTH. We call it as primary hyper, uh, primary parathyroidism. If there is high alkaline phosphatase, you have to suspect multiple myeloma. If there is low sodium, high potassium, think of aldosterone deficiency. Normally, aldosterone is supposed to conserve sodium and wash potassium out. If that reverse is occurring, aldosterone deficiency should be suspected. In Graves, invariably, you should have high T3. In hypothyroid patients, you will have sinus bradycardia. This is not ACG, this is ECG. In ECG, there will be sinus bradycardia. If someone comes to you with continuous vomiting, naturally they are losing H plus from the stomach. So acid loss will cause metabolic alkalosis. So the ABG has high CO2 and how do you know whether it's acute or chronic? You have to check bicarb. So if there is compensation from the bicarb side, that means it's a chronic one. If bicarb is normal, that means it's an acute one. If you give too much of NS infusions, that will cause hyperchloremic acidosis. So if they say that high anion gap metabolic acidosis has now changed to low and normal anion gap metabolic acidosis, they are trying to tell you there has been excess NS infusion. So how do we calculate anion gap? Sodium plus or minus uh, potassium. So potassium value is normally three or four less. So sometimes people omit this. So the anions required for anion gap calculation are bicarb and chloride. The cation is sodium. So the buffers, urinary buffers mainly are ammonium and phosphate. So most of the reabsorption is going to take place in the proximal convoluted tubule. So all the substances that get uh, that get uh, filtered are going to be absorbed in the proximal convoluted tube. So loop diuretics, this is like a stock question every time. It acts on the thick ascending loop of Henle on sodium potassium ATPase. Uh, this is the uh, place where they act on. So loop diuretics act on sodium potassium ATPase in the thick ascending loop of Henle. They might give expect this or this. So glucose in urine 
why does it appear so it is due to saturation of the transporters so that is saturation is the answer so low anion gap metabolic acidosis mostly because of hypoalbuminemia but for high anion you have a lot of uh, things that are possible cat mud piles i'm not going to explain this but you should all know high anion gap metabolic acidosis causes but for low anion they ask they expect you to know hypoalbuminemia so renal blood flow the sodium changes will be detected by the juxtaglomerular apparatus so whenever there is less renal blood flow so renin will be released let's look at the lung volumes so this is the normal inspiration expiration so when you take inspiration you are taking in 500 ml of air approximately when you exhale that this is the normal of end of normal expiration so even at the end of normal inspiration if you try you can take this much of air so that we call it as inspiratory reserve volume at the end of normal expiratory volume if you try to exhale more you will be able to exhale this much so we call that as expiratory reserve volume so no matter how much you try there is some volume that is left in the lungs that is called as residual volume so when you take a deep breath and do a forceful expiration you will reach till this point only so residual volume still stays in the lungs so after normal expiration what are the two volumes that are remaining in the lungs these are residual volume and expiratory reserve volume both of them are still remaining that is called as functional residual capacity so normal residual capacity is 1800 ml functional residual is 3.5 liters so that is 3500 ml so whatever the air that can be taken in and out at a time we call that as your vital capacity so your accessory muscle for expression is transverse abdominis so your stomach will abdomen will be trying to help you so total lung capacity includes all of these so in case of ascites and pregnancy your diaphragm is pushed into the chest so there will be pressure on the chest so fev1 so the air that moves out of the lungs in one second first second will be high because there is constant pressure on the chest so that is trying to push the air out so within the first second there is a lot of air going out because of ascites or pregnancy so the functional residual capacity will be low so this value is high this value is less so your ratio will be high fe1 by fec will be high in case of rib fractures they will be having pain so that pain will prevent inspiration so the tidal volume will be less in such people so tachypnea in pulmonary embolism so the cause is the c fiber receptors or juxta capillary receptors will be noticing uh, causing this tachypnea so asthmatic has tachypnea so this increased respiratory rate is driven by which factor so in asthmatics if there is accumulation of co2 that is going to cause the increased respiratory rate but the co2 is not directly going to impact the respiratory rate so this high co2 will translate into acidity in the csf low csf ph opioid overdose patient what happens in opioid overdose there is respiratory depression so there is a lot of co2 accumulating in the body now you have given naloxone so the respiratory rate improves what change will you see in the abg when respiratory rate improves the co2 will be washed away so the co2 will drop surfactant another important done they will ask either composition that is phospholipid produced by type 1 pneumocytes sorry type 1 pneumocytes are for gas exchange type 2 pneumocytes produce the surfactant the function of surfactant to reduce the surface tension so the question scenario might be different so premature baby got delivered in your ed and all so surfactant is deficient how does it function so function is reduces surface tension someone is a smoker recurrent infection why which cell is destroyed 
So smoking destroys the columnar ciliated epithelium. So that leads to improper ciliary function. And also there is excess mucus production from the goblet cells. So together, the sputum is not sent out. So it keeps accumulating. So now they will have recurrent infections. So this is because of dysfunctional mucociliary clearance. So central chemoreceptors respond to CO2 via reduced pH in the CSF. Whereas peripheral ones located at aortic and carotid bodies, they respond to both CO2 and O2. But the central ones respond to CO2. When you do hyperventilation, say someone comes to you with panic attacks, so they are hyperventilating, the CO2 is getting washed away. When CO2 washout occurs, cerebral vasoconstriction will occur. When cerebral vasoconstriction occurs, they will have painting. So that's the reason for painting. So the dead space normally is about 150 ml. That's the trachea and some of the bronchi. So they constitute to about 150 ml. So what happens in COPD is there is hyperinflation with damaged vasculature. So that leads to effectively increased dead space. So anatomical plus alveolar dead space together, we call it as physiological dead space. Anatomical dead space is this 150 ml and the damaged part we call it as alveolar dead space together we call it as high physiological high, uh, dead space. So the target oxygen saturations in COPD is 88 to 92 percent. So in case of fibrosis what happens it it is not going to expand easily. Whereas in emphysema, there is loss of structure, so easier to stretch. So this black line is the normal. So to increase one and a half boxes of, uh, so if to increase the two boxes of volume, so it is taking one and a half box change in the pressure. But in emphysema, to increase these two boxes of volume, only one box is required, pressure change is required. But in fibrosis, to increase the same boxes, two boxes of volume, we are requiring almost two and a half boxes of change in pressure. So we need to exert a lot of pressure to inflate the fibrosed lungs. So the compliance in fibrosis is less, whereas compliance in emphysema is high. So in fibrosis, the FE1 will increase. So FE1 by FPC ratio can actually increase. So again, we could cover only anatomy and physiology because we cannot cover the entire content. So if you do have any questions, you can reach out to me on Telegram or Facebook regarding MRCM related queries and do subscribe to this channel for updates. A recorded video will be made available on Facebook shortly and that Facebook link will be posted again in the Telegram channel, telegram.me slash med underscore meet. So I have another class in about one hour, so I won't be able to take many questions because if I start taking questions, it will be an end, endless, session. Pavan, we can close the session.